everyone. I'm John Butler with the University of Minnesota Libraries and a member of the MDL Governance Committee, as uh, Valerie uh, took a moment to, to point out. It's my great pleasure this morning to introduce Greg Cram, our keynote speaker. Uh, the library community is especially fortunate across the country to have this cadre of a few dozen individuals who are steadfastly focused on copyright issues in our libraries, uh, policy development, and implementation for the opportunities to live lawfully uh, by means of, of advancing access to our collections. Most, if not, well many, if, if not most of these individuals have risen out of the library professional ranks and developed expertise in copyright law and policy. Fewer of them, Greg, uh, among them, are credentialed attorneys who have chosen to work with, on behalf of, and within our libraries. And these good souls, I don't imagine, are doing it for the big bucks that libraries can offer. So we're especially appreciative of the expertise coming from the legal side. I've come to learn that these individuals hold a innate passion and commitment in their work to advance a longstanding and universal commitment that libraries hold, and that is to expand access to information resources as broadly as possible and to do so lawfully. Greg is a rising luminary and leader among these individuals. In his current position, Greg is Associate Director of Copyright and Information Policy at the New York Public Library, where he develops and implements the library's guidelines regarding the use of materials in the library's collections, and we'll hear about that. He leads efforts to research and analyze rights issues involving collection materials, and leads the library's Copyright Legislative Policy Committee to strategize and coordinate action to advance the library's goals of advancing and expanding access. Greg also, you may have read this, uh, holds the distinction of having testified before Congress. Now, who else in the room has testified before Congress? <laughs> Was there a hand over there? <laughs> he has testified before Congress on the first sale doctrine on behalf of New York Public Library a couple of years ago, and, and this is a foundational uh, part of the copyright statute to libraries. All of these credentials and his very important recent work over the past couple of years with the Digital Public Library of America and Europeana on rights statements development led us to a must-do invitation to bring Greg to Minnesota to speak with us today and help us chart our future uh, in these areas. So I hope you will please join me in welcoming Greg. Morning, everyone. Just gonna hit this. All right, so I'll start off with a little bit of a confession. Um, I really like flying. Not because I enjoy the longer and longer TSA lines or, or the frustrated travelers that are always around me or less and less leg room that I'm getting from airplanes lately. Um, I like traveling because it means there's usually something waiting for me at the other end that's exciting and new and interesting. I, I know many people find flying scary or complicated or even overwhelming, um, but for me, flying is a means to a great end. And, and I will put up with the TSA and I will put up with other things because it means at the other end of this, there's something cool. So for the next hour, we're gonna talk about a topic that's kind of like flying. Um, it can be complicated, scary, and overwhelming to some, but fighting through our fears and our concerns about these things can vastly improve the experience of exploring all of the great things that you have been digitizing um, and that we have been digitizing as a nation and as a, as a world. We want to do that to uh, allow our users uh, to have a better user experience and achieve our mission of expanding access to our collections as broadly as possible. So here's the roadmap for the next hour. Um, we're going to start off talking about that problem faced by our users. So what, what are the problems our users are encountering, especially when they want to reuse our content? 
We'll do a little bit of a copyright 101 or a little bit copyright basics. Um, I, it's hard for me to get in front of a crowd and not do a copyright 101. So we'll do a little bit of it. I promise it will be short. Um, the next is some of the goals. I want to talk about the goals for the rightstatements.org project that John mentioned in the intro. Uh, we'll talk more about what that project was and how the goals of that project um, really shaped the, the statements that came out of it. We'll do a little bit of a walkthrough through the statements so you understand uh, what, the, what the statements are and what they actually uh, mean. And then we'll talk about the DPLA implementation of these statements and how we expect DPLA uh, and even local partners like NYPL to implement these statements uh, and make it easier for our users to uh, access our collections. So we'll start at the beginning. So our users are, are facing a problem when accessing our collections. And that problem has its roots in a few different trends in libraries. The, the first trend is that we uh, have spent the last hundreds or more years focused on physical objects in our collections. And these are the stacks uh, at NYPL. Um, we focused for 100 years on our physical objects, but now we're increasingly focused on digital objects. And this shift from patrons coming to libraries to libraries meeting patrons has a few different implications. The first implication is that libraries are digitizing their own collections, whether in-house at a camera station like this or on a scanner, flatbed scanner, or partnering with others to digitize that content. They're doing all of that in an effort to expand access to our patrons online so they can come to our websites and find that content. The second implication of this shift to meet patrons online is that cultural heritage institutions are pushing content beyond the four corners of their websites. They're sharing digital content with third parties to enhance access and reach our users. They're sharing content with Digital Public Library of America and Hathi Trust so that the users can find aggregators to go to to find the content they're looking for. But all of this digitization and sharing brings us to the third implication, um, and that's copyright liability. Statutory damages under copyright liability are up to $150,000 per work infringed. So if you digitize 10 items and you hit this worst case, absolute worst case scenario, you're looking at $1.5 million in potential damages. Uh, but we don't digitize 10 items at a time at NYPL. We're digitizing thousands of items at a time. So if I digitize 1,000 items and get it wrong, I'm at $150 million in potential statutory damages. Uh, we just finished a digitization project about a year ago of a collection of 20,000 images that would have put my statutory damages in the worst case scenario over $1.8 billion uh, if we chose not to, if we had, uh, if we had hit the worst case scenario. 1.8 billion, although NYPL is a big library, 1.8 billion is way beyond our means, uh, but we still did the project, and I'll tell you why we did the project a little bit later. But these numbers get really scary really quickly. And unfortunately, there have been a few copyright lawsuits against libraries in, in recent years. Um, the UCLA, UCLA was sued over streaming of videos. Uh, Georgia State has been in an ongoing litigation about their uh, digitization of material. And there was even a lawsuit against Hathi Trust, which they successfully defeated. And that's the good news. Libraries have been successful at defeating these lawsuits and have been successfully defending their activities. We'll talk about uh, in a few minutes why we shouldn't be scared of those big, the big numbers that I just told you, the $150 million in potential damages. Um, but those numbers are out there. All right, the second trend that's forcing us to consider and reconsider our user experience is actually coming uh, in the physical space. And that's the trend in libraries to provide new kinds of creation and tools uh, for authorship. For example, this is the Chattanooga Public Library's fourth floor makerspace which provides educational uh, and tools to support the creation of new knowledge in the 21st century. And our users are responding to this, right? They're really excited about makerspaces and they're really excited about using new tools to develop new knowledge and new, new uh, creative activities. This, uh, they increasingly view cultural heritage institutions as places where they can create and not just places where they just sit down and read a book or, or see a, a beautiful painting. Instead, they're finding that the libraries are, and other cultural heritage institutions are there where they can come in and create materials. But the problem is that we've done that really well, we're doing that well, uh, increasingly well, in physical spaces. But how do we do that same thing in digital spaces? How do we do that with our newly digitized content? 
One way to do it is to make it really clear to our users about what they can use and what they might not be able to use. And we do that through write statements. For example, here's how NYPL describes objects it believes have no known US copyright restrictions. It's a long and wonky sentence or statement. Uh, users don't usually get past the first couple of words. And it's not a great way to do it, but that's how we have been doing it for, uh, for a couple of years now. And these statements are generally stored as some part of the rights metadata in their systems. Um, and we'll talk more about rights metadata in a minute. But the way to encourage reuse of materials and explore and educate on new knowledge and new ways to create knowledge is to start making it more clear to our users about what they can and can't do with assets. All right, the third trend that's kind of pushing uh, this is rights metadata. So cultural heritage institutions are starting to track and analyze facts relevant to the copyright status of objects in their collections. They're also aggregating the data about and agreements about uh, those objects into a single place so that they know what they can do with those assets and what users can do with those assets. DPLA partners are also making some of this data available to users today. And this is a good point to kind of introduce myself. John did a great job of introduction, but let me tell you a little bit of a, my story at NYPL. Uh, my story at NYPL begins with this date, 1923. Um, that's because NYPL has been digitizing material for about 10 years before I started at the library. But they were really focused solely on book plates um, from books published before 1923. That's what we were shooting. It became really apparent really quickly that having a digital library that stops at 1923 wasn't sufficient for NYPL. We wanted to expand our digitization efforts and break through this barrier of 1923. But to do that, we had to get out of our comfort zone. And that's kind of where I come in. I was hired five years ago. I'm the Associate Director of Copyright and Information Policy. Long title, what does that actually mean? Um, well, there's about 45 of us who do what I do across the country. Um, we work in universities, we work in libraries to really push the boundaries of how we make content available and how we use that content. But of the 45 of us, I'm the only one at a public library. So I am the copyright person at NYPL. I'm the copyright nerd, self-avowed. Uh, I, am, I am the nerd on this. My job is to expand access as broadly as possible, both in the physical spaces, but also in our digital spaces. I work with curators to increase access to our collections as broadly as possible. My second job is don't get sued <laughs> and lose. Oh, wait, we have to do this again. Don't get sued <laughs> and lose. And do those things in that order. So I am a licensed attorney, and I work at the library, but I am not an attorney for the library. I don't work in our general counsel's office. I work very closely with them, but I don't work for them. I work for the director of our library. And we did that on purpose. Uh, if I was in the general counsel's office, my job might be different. My job might be, first and foremost, don't get sued. And then my second job was expand access when possible. Um, we did this intentionally, we built this position intentionally so that the job would be to push and not necessarily always be conservative about everything that we do. So because copyright is so fundamental to, we do, to everything that we do, I'm also increasingly finding myself engaged in copyright policy conversations, especially now that Congress has started the review. As John said, I testified a few years ago about copyright issues before Congress, um, but we're also investigating and, and engaging with the Copyright Office uh, today on policy. Um, if you haven't been, if you haven't, uh, if you're not a copyright nerd, you might not have known that yesterday the Copyright Office asked for comments on the library uh, and archives exceptions in Section 108 of the Copyright Law. That means they're interested in reforming or proposing re reforms to that bill, reforms to that section, and uh, we'll see how that shakes out. But that's part of my job now, is to increasingly focus on uh, copyright policy issues. When I started, though, five plus years ago, my job was to develop and implement a rights database to track the metadata, the rights metadata, in our collection items. And when I started, uh, I found something kind of surprising. Uh, in an industry that cares a lot, sometimes to the point of obsession about standardized data and schemas, there is no generally accepted and implemented rights metadata schema that's widely adopted by institutions. In fact, for most institutions, rights data is found in some kind of Dublin Core free text field. Um, it's usually not controlled, it's usually just some kind of textual information. 
That isn't to say that others haven't tried to develop standardized schemas. Uh, Getty and the California Digital uh, Library and even Hadi Trust have tried and thought deeply about copyright metadata and even California Digital issued uh, their own copyright MD schema, um, but it hasn't seen widespread adoption. And there's a couple of reasons why that's true, but it's hard to implement rights data when you don't have someone who can really help uh, figure out what data should go in those fields. Others like NYPL use their own rights metadata schemas. Uh, the schema that you're seeing run across your screen is the way that we enter rights into our system. And you'll see there are more fields there than what's offered in a premise kind of system or other kind of metadata systems. We are detailed, um, almost to the point of obsession, about our rights metadata. But perhaps this industry-wide lack of consistency is okay when we're focusing solely on our own websites. When an object appears on our own website, maybe it's okay that we have a Dublin Core field that has some text in it and is not controlled. But if you're a metadata aggregator like DPLA or Europeana dealing with 43 million items across the two collections, um, then we start to see the problems of uncontrolled data. So let's step back for a second and think about uh, our users encountering 43 million items from thousands of con contributing partner institutions. Users who want to use this content in a manner consistent with copyright law are really asking us tough questions. They're encountering these items and asking us, can I reuse this item? Is this item in copyright? What is its copyright status if it's not in copyright? And can I facet down my search of the 43 million items that are out there to reveal items that have the right status or the rights uh, permissions that I enable me to allow, uh, enable me to reuse those items? As cultural heritage institutions, how do we communicate the answers to these questions in a way that's responsible? So we don't want to be providing legal advice, first and foremost, right? But we do want to empower our users to make and use, uh, make their own determinations about how they can use these assets. Today, our answers to these questions are a bit of a mess. Because there isn't the standardized rights metadata schema, there's, there's not even a way to express our knowledge about items in a standardized way. And that means we get results like this. Of the 13 million items in DPLA, contributing institutions have used over 100,000 unique right statements. 100,000. This is a visualization of those statements to get a sense of how messy the data is. Um, but another way to think about it is to think about it in Minnesota terms. So how many lakes do you have in Minnesota? 10,000, right? So that means there's 10 Minnesotas worth of ways we express data to our users. That's not so great. Not that I don't love Minnesota, but 10 of them. <laughs> Another way to look at this is based on the total number of words used by us in our data. Of all of the fields DPLA partners express data in, 25% of the words we use are found in a single field, 25%. So those metadata folks out there would really, really, really be excited if the answer uh, to which field this data was found in would be the descriptive metadata field, right? We want to use more words to describe our assets than other fields, right? Unfortunately, you'd be wrong. Uh, the descriptive metadata field only accounts for 22% of the words we use, 22. 25% instead are devoted to the right statement field, a single field. Uh, and the reason why is we have statements like this. Even if our users read our right statements field, even if they're long like this, they're not gonna come away with really satisfying answers. DPLA is replete with examples of institutions trying to assert new copyrights in their phot photography of two-dimensional objects. For example, this contributor, uh, I'm not gonna name them, but you can see their name, uh, <laughs> is claiming a new copyright from 2010 of their photography of an item that certainly appears to be in the public domain. The item was published before 1923 and is therefore public domain in the US. Um, and yet there's a copyright notice that says Digital Image Copyright 2010. The notice is actually also tells you more. It says that all rights are reserved and if you want to use this object or know more about the object, you need to contact the library itself. So asserting rights in things makes it even more complicated for our users to understand what they can actually do with these assets. Which leads our users to kind of feel like this. Right? Not so happy. 
So what do we do? Uh, so it's really easy to identify the problem. It's easy for me to stand up here and tell you our rights metadata and our rights statements aren't so great. The harder part is to actually attempt to solve it. So I work in library land, and in library land, if you've got a big problem and you need to solve it, you bring together a team, right? We all collaborate. So that's what, uh, that's what you do, but to do that across uh, many institutions, you need funding. So DPLA went out and got a grant. DPLA received a grant from the Knight Foundation for $300,000 to work on this project. DPLA, partnering with Europeana, with advice from Creative Commons, brought together expertise uh, to, to fix this problem or to work on this problem. Here's a list of all of the people uh, who worked on this project. Um, but these are experts in copyright and metadata and open data. And these, this group of people was there to lay the foundation to improve our users' experiences. After two years of work, the group launched rightstatements.org at DPLA Fest this year. And before we get into the goals of the project and the statements themselves, I just want to take a step back and talk about copyright law for a few minutes. So, um, who created a work protected by copyright law today? Raise your hand. Did you create a work protected by copyright today? Okay. For those of you who have your hands down, uh, did you do any of the following? Did you write a Facebook post? Shoot a Vine video, it's probably a little too early to shoot a Vine video, but maybe if you did it yesterday. Uh, write an email, draw a doodle, take a photograph, write a paper. If you did any of those things, your hand should have been raised because you created a work protected by copyright law. Copyright is everywhere. Unlike much of federal law, copyright protects or impacts us all day, every day. We create works automatically protected by copyright every day, and we use works that are automatically protected by copyright law every day. But despite its pervasiveness in our daily lives, it's not always well understood. And that's why I always do a little bit of a copyright background, Copyright 101, um, to help people understand how important copyright law is to their work. Copyright law's foundation comes from the Constitution, which gives Congress the power to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. A couple of words I want to highlight for you, uh, limited times. Um, we'll talk more about limited times here in a second, but just remember the Constitution requires us to have limited times. So what does copyright protect? Well, it protects original works of authorship fixed in any tangible medium of expression. Original works fixed in a tangible medium of expression. For example, books and fine art and music and movies, all protected by copyright law because they're all original and they're all fixed in a tangible medium of expression. But information in phone books is not protected by copyright law. It's factual information. There's no creative expression to those things. Um, there may be a very, very thin copyright about how that, those facts are expressed, but for the most part, facts in a phone book, not protected, right? Not original works of authorship. In 1999, we also learned something about the kind of photography that's protected under copyright law. Um, we were told by a judge that elements of originality may include posing the subjects, lighting, angle, selection of film uh, and camera, evoking the desired expression, and almost any other variant involved. But slavish copying, slavish copying, although doubtless requiring technical skill and effort, does not qualify for copyright protection. In other words, although my photography staff at NYPL um, are some of the best out there, they bring years of experience and care and professionalism to the work that they do, their job for two-dimensional objects is to take as close a picture to the original as they absolutely can. Their job is to make slavish reproductions of digital or physical objects so that we can use them and make them available digitally. That means that we don't assert new rights in those, that photography because the courts have told us that that doesn't, that photography doesn't grant us new rights. But again, back to this example, there are examples of institutions trying to claim rights. So we have this problem. Um, but let me go back to copyright law. So copyright is a set of exclusive monopoly rights. It's the rights that a rights holder gets um, when they own a copyright. Sometimes we call it a bundle of rights. You might have heard a bundle of rights. Um, those rights include the rights to create copies, to create derivatives, to distribute copies, uh, and to even publicly perform and display those copies. So every summer out of the back of NYPL, we face Bryant Park, um, and there's always a summer movie series. So HBO, who sponsors the series, is clearing rights with rights holders to publicly perform and display these, these films. 
All of these rights the rights holders get are balanced against a set of exceptions and limitations to these rights, and these permit users to lawfully use works without the permission of rights holders. For cultural heritage institutions, fair use is the most important factor, or one of the most important limitations on those exclusive rights. It allows us to make uses that are socially beneficial and have little to no market harm for the original. Fair use is also critical to content creators, uh, especially documentary filmmakers use fair use all the time when they include works in their films. Uh, it's hard for me to get off of the fair use topic, but I will. Um, we'll talk about fair use in, in breakout sessions, or if you want to talk about fair use, um, come find me, but um, I'm going to limit my talk just to that. So these exceptions and limitations come in handy when we talk about the duration of copyright protection. Today, it's life of the author plus 70 years, but it hasn't always been that way. When we started, the framers decided that copyright protection should last for 14 years after the date of publication. And that's it, 14 years. Uh, you had an option to renew for another 14 at the end of the first 14, but you had to affirmatively do something to do it. But that's what you got, 14 years. Uh, today, it's now life of the author plus 70, and uh, they are now, we'll see, uh, there, the public domain clock is starting to tick, and in two and a half years, that, that 1923 rule will start to roll forward. But we will see whether there's another push to extend this another 20 years or not. All right, so what happens when someone infringes these exclusive rights? Uh, in other words, what happens when you violate one of the rights reserved for the rights holder? Well, if there's infringement, then there's a few different remedies available to the rights holder. First, monetary damages in the amount of lost earnings for the rights holder. And for cultural heritage memory or cultural heritage institutions thinking about risk, uh, when you're thinking about what are the monetary damages of our use of assets, there's a few questions you should ask yourself. Um, first, was the work previously commercially exploited? That'll help you get a sense of how uh, valuable that work is. Uh, there's a second question is whether there's a potential market for that work now. That'll give you a sense of what, what damages could be if you use that work. Um, is the work associated with an individual or organization that might have a financial, reputational, or competitive interest in restricting access or reuse? Um, once you've asked yourself those questions, uh, you're really going to come down to a risk analysis. And the risk exposure is likely to be pretty low in most cases. When we think about lost profits, um, the way that you can think about that is think about all of that sweet, sweet green cash that you're earning off of your preservation and use of these assets. Oh, right, that's right, you don't make money off of it. So the actual profits that we're talking about here are probably pretty low. Um, the, worst, the, the harder case is when something has been registered. If the work has been registered with the Copyright Office, then statutory damages are available to rights holders. That starts, or that, that can be up to $30,000 per work infringed, and in the worst case scenario, up to $150,000 per work infringed. But there's some good news here. Um, if you are a libraries, archives, or educational institution, and you've been deemed to have infringed, but you had a reasonable belief that your use was a fair use, even though you may have got that, that determination wrong, if you had a reasonable belief that your use was a fair use, then the judge can waive or will waive all damages, all statutory damages. So good to, to keep track of when you think you're making fair uses, to have a, a note in your file that says, this is why we think it's a fair use, so that if you ever have to run into this, hopefully you never have to, but if you do, you have a tool that you can use to get rid of statutory damages. The last option for a rights holder uh, who's facing someone who's infringing their works is to seek an injunction, to have the court order someone to stop that user from using the copyrighted work. All right, so let me put some numbers behind this. There's, there's been some recent scholarship on the number of copyright lawsuits brought against libraries and archives. In the last five years, there have been a little over 1,100 cases filed involving a defendant use, uh, with the words library or archives in its name. Now that doesn't mean there have been 1,100 lawsuits against libraries and archives. It means though that there are 1,100 lawsuits against people who have the word library or archives in their, their name. We could be talking about you know, the Xerox archives or something that's not really a library. But of those 1,100 cases, only 13 or about 1% of those suits were designated as copyright lawsuits, 1%. So when, when people are being sued and when there are lawsuits, a very small number, less than 1%, around 1%, um, are actually copyright infringement lawsuits. 
All right, so copyright rules set the ground rules uh, or default rules that we all play by, but those rules can change between parties, and that's through contract law. Rights holders and only rights holders can grant users permission to use items in ways beyond those permitted by copyright law. So rights holders can allow people to use works beyond the exceptions and limitations they have in the law um, by having an agreement with them. Users can also agree to give up their rights under copyright law to anyone, including digitization partners. And we see that happen a lot. When a library has a, has a microfilm or has a, a set of newspapers they want to have digitized but they can't afford to do it or they don't want to do it, and there's a third party out there who's willing to pay, often that third party will ask for some restriction or limitation on your use of those assets, even though they're not the rights holder. Now we try, hopefully, to get rid of as many of those uh, waivers of our rights as possible, but it's not always possible, and that happens. We'll talk more about how the right statements accommodate this situation um, as we go forward. All right, so let's take a walk through the statements themselves. Um, again, they were launched in April this year, and we'll talk about uh, the set of goals that went under these statements so they can kind of see, when you see the statements, how we were able to meet or not meet these goals. The first goal was to have these right statements be simple. The goal is to capture at a high level the most common right situations for items made available through the DPLA and Europeana. The goal was to keep the number of statements low and manageable to limit complexity. We wanted to avoid the situation we're in today with uh, more than 100,000 statements being used and try to get that down to a dozen or so. We try to strike a balance between making these as friendly to users as possible against our uh, legal obligations and implications of sharing copyright status determinations. That means we tried to limit out the legal jargon as much as we could while still, hopefully, making general counsel's, general's counsel uh, happy. Um, we'll see if we got that goal. But we tried. The second principle was to keep these statements flexible, and that's because there is no international copyright law. Instead, we have about 200 different national copyright laws. So these statements have to be able to work in some capacity for as many countries as possible. That means we need to limit the number of country-specific rights statements down, and I think we got there. We only have one uh, specific country-specific statement. We also need these statements to be flexible enough for the institutions who will be assigning them to their items. And you'll see some how, how some of these statements give institutions the options to add additional data on their sites about the specific limitations or permissions that are implicated by the statement. But they also need to be flexible enough um, for institutions to be able to choose from one of those statements when they overlap so they can uh, use their, uh, apply their risk profile. The statements also need to be flexible enough to have a process to update them. Um, we probably didn't get it right the first time around. In fact, we know we didn't because we put out a white paper, a draft white paper, and we got comments back. And the comments really helped shape the statements. Um, so we put out a second draft, and that was the draft uh, that ultimately was launched in April. But it's likely that we got something wrong. Um, it's likely that as more and more of you use these statements, we'll find that we need to add or, or eliminate statements as we go forward. The third goal was to have a descriptive, ha have these statements be descriptive. They're meant to describe the copyright status of the work as evaluated by the contributing institution. We don't want to be providing legal advice, but we want to help users make their own decisions. These statements are not meant to weigh in on whether the work can be used under some specific limitation or exception like fair use. Instead, it's meant to describe the copyright status of the objects, and that's it. There are a few cases where the rights holder has authorized reuse or that someone has restricted use, and we want to be able to communicate that appropriately, but they're meant to be descriptive, not prescriptive. The next goal was to have these statements be accurate. And because there are so many different kinds of intellectual property out there, we wanted to limit our focus solely to copyright law. If we didn't, we would either have many, many, many permutations of a statement, statements that would be no copyright, rights of publicity, rights of privacy, and no trademark, right? That's a long statement for something like this. So to avoid that situation, we just decided to strip out and ignore rights of privacy, publicity, trademarks, and trade secrets. Those are not implicated by these statements. Instead, these statements are only describing the copyright status so that they can be accurate. The last goal was that we wanted these statements to be transparent. These statements apply not just to the work, the underlying work, but to the digital item that's been contributed. 
That means when an institution has agreed to a restriction, it should be noted in the rights profile or in the rights statement. We recognize that some institutions uh, sometimes agree with rights holders or digitization partners to add restrictions so that they can make items available. Uh, so these statements need to be uh, accounting for that and be transparent enough that it's clear to the user that's what's going on. Transparency also means encouraging statements to uh, people not to use statements like this where they add digital copyrights. So generally there are, four, uh, there are four clusters here. As we think about how to actually write these statements, we found that the data kind of self-organized somewhat. Um, there are four clusters of write statements in this da data visualization. One is in copyright. One is no restrictions or public domain. Um, the little orange corner in the upper left is Creative Commons. And the fourth category, which is the larger bottom right category, is unknown. And that statement all the way at the very bottom right, um, the one big massive statement that accounts for a significant amount of DPLA's right statements, um, I wrote that statement uh, two years ago. And uh, it's a really bad statement. And we won't use it again. <laughs> I'm part of the problem. Uh, this is a nice little, yeah. Anyway, so I'm part of the problem, but I'm also part of the solution. So uh, right statements themselves are made up of three main categories, and we're gonna walk through the statements in each of these categories. The first one is in copyright, second one is no copyright, and the third one is other. These statements should be in your packets, but I'll walk through them as we, uh, as we go. So uh, the first statement is in copyright. How easy is that? Uh, super vanilla, very basic. It means exactly what it sounds like, that the item is in copyright. The second statement is in copyright EU orphan work. That means that the item's been identified as an orphan work under the terms of the EU orphan works directive. It's really targeted toward institutions that can actually use the directive, more European institutions than US institutions. Uh, it indicates that the work has been identified in copyright, but the rights holders just can't be found after a reasonably diligent search. We have the non-EU version of this, which is rights holders unlocatable or unidentifiable. Uh, it means the same thing. It just means that you're not subject to the EU Orphan Works Initiative. The fourth is in copyright educational uses permitted. It means that the, cop the work is in copyright, but that educational uses have been permitted by the rights holder without the need to obtain additional permission. Uh, this, is, this will be used likely in situations where the rights holder has permitted institutions to tell users uh, that they can use those works for educational purposes without further contact with the rights holder. Um, a st another statement kind of in the same vein is the non-commercial use statement. It, same thing, it indicates that the item is in copyright but that the non-commercial uses are pre-approved and they don't need to go back to the rights holder to do that. Again, it's likely because the rights holder has given the institution the, the permission to make the item available to others for non-commercial purposes. So there are, those are our five in copyright statements. Um, for our out of copyright statements, or our no copyright statements, the first one is out of copyright, no commercial use only, or non-commercial use only. It indicates that the work is in the public domain, but that the organization that published the work is contractually required to allow only non-commercial uses by third parties. Usually, we expect this to be uh, instituted or happening when uh, the digitization of objects are part of projects like Google Books in the EU. I under those arrangements in the EU, those institutions who had their works digitized by Google are required to have this statement, uh, the non-commercial use only. The second statement is no copyright contractual restrictions apply. It means that the underlying works in the public domain, but that the organization that published the item is required to restrict certain forms of use by third parties. It's, this is usually because of donor agreements or digitization agreements. Uh, and hopefully the, the institutions who are using that statement will indicate what those contractual restrictions are on their, their site. The third uh, no copyright statement is no copyright other known legal restrictions. This is kind of an amorphous statement, and it really isn't meant for the US institutions. It's really there for countries that have laws that are kind of copyright-like, but they're not copyright themselves. Usually they're there to protect uh, expressions of traditional cultural knowledge or traditional cultural expressions um, where there's some kind of copyright-like system, um, but that, is not, that they're not in copyright themselves. The fourth no copyright statement is no copyright United States. Now, you, I, heard, I, I told you at the beginning that uh, we were trying to limit down the number of country-specific statements, and this is the only one that kind of survived. 
Uh, the reason why we have a U.S. public domain statement is in part because the way the U.S. calculates copyright status is different than many, many, many other countries. In fact, there are works that are in the public domain today that were published as late as 1988. Um, those things are in the public domain in the U.S., but not, are, are very likely not in the public domain in any other country. That's why we have to have this special statement. There are also a set of other rights statements, and these are statements that are less uh, definitive for our users and less helpful for our users, but we need them nonetheless. Uh, the first one is no known copyright. It means that, that the data provider believes that no copyright exists for the item, but that they weren't able to reach a conclusive determination. That means they weren't able to have point to a specific fact or point to a, the, the lack of a fact to determine that this item is in the public domain. This is gonna be especially useful as we think about archival collections where there's older material, um, where publication status isn't totally clear, and we're not able to make a conclusive determination, but we still wanna tell our users that we don't think there's a copyright in it. The second is copyright not evaluated. Uh, it means the data provider didn't actually evaluate the copyright status of the object. Now, there are some plaintiff's attorneys, uh, copyright plaintiff's attorneys, that would be chomping at the bit for institutions to use this statement. Um, don't do it unless you need to. Uh, and the reason why you might want to use this statement is if, you're, if you believe your use is a fair use, um, regardless of the copyright status of the object, and it would take more time to evaluate that copyright status than it would to do the fair use analysis, you might skip that copyright status determination and use this statement. But we're, we're, we'll caution you against that uh, as much as we possibly can. The third statement is copyright undetermined. And although if you're on the rightstatements.org uh, site today, you're not gonna see this statement there. Um, but the statement copyright undetermined uh, means that the object, uh, the, the, right, the uh, organization making it available wasn't able to make a determination about the copyright status of the object. They looked, they tried, but they weren't able to make a, a decision either way. Now the reason why that statement isn't in the current rightstatements.org package is because it actually kind of got dropped by accident. Um, we, we just kind of lost it in an edit. Um, it's coming back, I promise. Uh, I wrote the language, the language is done. It's gonna be implemented hopefully in the next few weeks here, um, but it's coming back. So if you don't see it on rightstatements.org today, it will be there soon. All right, all of these statements come with these additional notices at the bottom. Uh, one of them is no warranties, and these this is there to keep the lawyers happy. No warranties means that the institution uh, shouldn't, be, uh, shouldn't be held liable for the works or for the use of objects uh, where the user was relying on those statements to make those uses. In other words, it's there to tell our users, we think that's the, the right statement, but we're not gonna, we can't stand behind it legally. The second notice is that other rights might apply. There might be other rights implicated by your use, including rights of privacy, rights of publicity, trademark rights, moral rights, but those things don't apply here. We're not, these statements aren't meant to deal with those things. And the third kind of additional notice that you'll see in many of these statements is this additional information statement. It's there for rights or for institutions to clearly communicate the contract restrictions or contract permissions that they have uh, when they use those statements. Although I should warn you, if you're gonna use additional information, you have to be clear that the additional information doesn't contradict the right statements themselves. What we don't wanna see is someone saying contractual restrictions apply, and then their contractual restrictions are, I assert a right in this, my, my institution asserts a right in this. That's, that's in contravene, uh, that contravenes the pur purpose of the right statements, so we hope that statement isn't there. In other words, in all cases, these statements assume that no new rights are created in the digitization process, um, even though some cultural heritage institutions like our friends in the museum world sometimes think they own rights in their photography. So the, back to this uh, uh, visualization, there's this fourth cluster, this small little cluster in the upper left, um, and that fourth cluster is the Creative Commons cluster. Um, another set of licenses you're likely to encounter or have encountered in your work in libraries is the Creative Commons licenses. And these are licenses applied by rights holders that give permission, uh, pre-approval, for, uh, for the use of their objects in, in ways that are compliant with the licenses. These CC licenses are applied by the rights holder and not by institutions. Unless your institution owns the rights in those objects, you shouldn't be applying CC licenses to those works. 
Even uh, the Creative Commons public domain tools like CC0, which is an absolute waiver of rights, um, will be uh, permitted by DPLA as part of the, the rights statements uh, field. Um, CC0, the CC0 is, uh, you should be familiar with because we're using that now to waive any and all rights we might have in the metadata that we contribute to DPLA. Now there is some conversation about whether CC0, whether waiving our rights is even necessary for metadata. I told you at the beginning that factual data is not protected by copyright law. But DPLA chose to resolve those questions in a way that encourages reuse, and therefore they require that any con contributors use CC0 to the extent that anything is protected by copyright law and waive any of those rights so that it can enable more and broader reuse. There's also this Creative Commons public domain mark. And you, if you look at the list of statements, uh, we don't have a vanilla public domain statement. And that's because CC Creative Commons beat us to it. They have a public domain mark, and it means that the, the item where this statement is applied is in the public domain. But it's a special kind of statement. It means that the work is in the public domain in every country. Now, I don't know about you, uh, but determining the copyright status of an item across 200 countries sounds ambitious. Uh, maybe impossible, I don't know. Uh, sounds difficult. Uh, not something that NYPL is in any kind of position to do. We evaluate the copyright status of objects under US law and pretty much only under US law. So this public domain mark, while it will be an eligible statement, would, should only be applied to statements that are, or to objects that are very, very old. And we'll talk more about what very, very, very old means. But uh, generally speaking, we want to apply it only to works that are out of copyright in all jurisdictions. So here's the list of statements we anticipate DPLA hubs using. Uh, and in fact, DPLA hubs will be required to apply one of these statements to each of the objects they contribute through DPLA. It's not that long a list. It's not too bad. Uh, we've gotten down from 100,000 down to a much more manageable number. Um, so hopefully, we can get implementation uh, rolling on this soon. So let's talk about that implementation. Um, so this all sounds like a lot of work, right? Sounds really scary. Yeah, uh, sounds overwhelming, um, but we're doing this for a reason, right? We're doing this in an effort to make more information available to our users, and that's what we've been doing for a very long time. The whole point of descriptive metadata is to describe objects, and rights metadata is really just another way to describe those objects. So we can do it, it's possible. I'll talk more this afternoon about how NYPL has been able to review 83% of our digitized content in less than three years. We've been able to get through over a million assets in, in less than three years. That means over a million captures now have rights information at NYPL. That's a, that's a pretty good uh, accomplishment, and we'll talk more this afternoon about how we got there. Um, but the, the goal of all of this, the reason why we're going to put ourselves through this pain, um, is in part because we want to make it easier for our users to get access to this material and understand how they can use it. So it's gonna take some effort, um, but in the end, our users are gonna be able to go to DPLA or go to our own sites and be able to facet on these things. They're gonna ask the question, can I use it? And we are, for the first time, going to have a, an answer that makes sense to them and that they can an anticipate on every single cultural heritage website they go to. They'll be able to say, can I use it? And there'll be answers that say yes, and some restrictions apply, or non-commercial uses are permitted, or other status, the status is unknown. Um, they'll also be able to facet on the right statements themselves and say, show me all of the, the issue or all of the items that are in the public domain in the United States today. So that's their hope, that's their goal. Um, they'll also be able to go to the individual item pages and see the object with a little bug at the bottom that describes, uh, that, that gives the graphical representation of what the copyright statement is. So DPLA is gonna start this implementation with willing partners. Because NYPL has been tracking copyright status in our metadata for a number of years, we'll be the first ones to go. We'll be the first ones to implement. Um, we expect NYPL to have uh, implemented, at least through DPLA, uh, within three weeks or maybe even six weeks after the release of that extra right statement, the, the undetermined statement. Um, so that we'll be able to go first and you can learn from our mistakes. But the hope is to get a coalition of the willing to be the first ones who are not NYPL to start working on this and to start adding statements to their, their items. The goal, the very ambitious goal, is to have accurate statements for the overwhelming majority of items in DPLA. 
Ooh, two years, right? That's scary. Um, but we shouldn't be too scared about it because Europeana was able to do it. Europeana took two years to get from about 46% of items with write statements to 100% of, of items with write statements in, in two years. They were able to take that red bar that's the no statements and get it down to zero within about two years. Now look, Europeana has some uh, advantage or has some staff devoted to this, so they've, they've been able to get through it a little bit faster than others might be able to. But that's the goal. The goal is to have accurate write statements for the overwhelming majority of items in DPLA in the next two years, two plus years. But our goal is not speed just for the sake of speed. Two years is kind of fungible. Um, the statements need to be accurate. DPLA has already hosted some educational sessions for service hubs and will likely host even more sessions for DPLA partners um, across the system. If you really want to hear me speak for another three hours, you can go to dpla.org, go to the workshops, and you can listen to, to me uh, to talk about copyright in a much more uh, a longer version uh, than, the, than the five minutes, ten minutes you got here. But there's going to be some hurdles uh, to clear before we can do this in two years. Right? And the first problem is for local institutions to work to develop internal guidance about their policies and practices. For example, institutions are going to have to work out when they apply statements that have some overlap. Uh, this statement, the public domain statement, the CC public domain, no copyright US and no known copyright have some overlap. So if you're going to use the CC PDM statement, the public domain mark statement, um, what cutoff are you going to use for your institution? Are you going to say items that were created more than 120 years ago, 140 years ago, we're going to use this statement? For co copyright uh, or public domain in the US, when do you have enough confidence to apply the PDUS statement versus the uncertain kind of no known rights? As an institution, you're going to have to make those decisions. It has to comply with your risk profile and what you feel comfortable with making. Uh, most DPLA hubs are not uh, lucky enough to have one of the 45 of us who do what I do, to, have, to be able to have IP experts on staff. So it's going to take some time to work out that local policy. Second, the second big hurdle we've got to clear is that the URIs are the preferred method for communicating co these copyright statements, these right statements. Every one of these statements has a URI associated with it, but not all of our metadata systems can handle URIs today. DPLA is working with willing hubs now to test out different metadata management systems and how they interact with DPLA and how they can pass URIs on a DPLA. The third issue is what do we do with all this extra data that's there today? Where should all this extra data live? Um, what about the licenses or restriction-based statements? How does it live in the DPLA environment? What fields do we need to use? How are we going to do that? DPLA is working out these issues with hubs now and will share back the solutions and decisions they make um, going forward. So one of the other implications of using write statements is that we'll be able to use those things on our own websites. For NYPL, we're going to implement a few weeks after those, that final statement is published. We're going to crosswalk our current internal statements to these new statements and start making those statements available on our website. We're going to show those statements on our website and in our APIs so that users can use those URIs to, get, to be able to sort and filter based on what we have. The next phase, ideally in the next phase, we're going to start to share more than just the statements themselves. Imagine if a, data, if a user could go to a website that's using these statements and see the underlying data that was used to justify that, that determination. So if they could, if you had an item that was marked public domain um, and you had a, a publication date of 1923 or 1922 under it, that would really increase your confidence in that statement, the accuracy of that statement. So in the next phase, I think that's what's going to happen is that institutions are going to be encouraged to share the underlying factual data that led them to the determination that they made. Even a broader uh, goal for this project is, or a broader implication of it, is that we're, for the first time, uh, going to have a registry of public domain items. The Copyright Office doesn't keep such registry. It has no idea what items are protected by copyright law today or which items are in the public domain. So we don't have a way of, of having a, a registry of those works. Instead, we've got to do the determinations ourselves. We'll talk more this afternoon about how NYPL is doing that, but we've got to do that work ourselves. The hope is that after a few years of implementation and, and using the URIs in our APIs, 
someone out there is going to build a registry of items that are in the public domain, and not just public domain in, US, in the US, but public domain worldwide, or public domain in many, many countries. That's an implication that's far off, but it might happen. We'll see. All right, so how do you do this? So how do you start adding uh, these statements? Well, if I were starting from scratch, the first thing that I would do was use my descriptive metadata that already exists out there. I'm gonna leverage that descriptive data to find the low-hanging fruit that I can use to start applying right statements. For example, if you've digitized published material, I would start with that material. That's really easy. Um, published material is actually very, is very straightforward for the most part. I'd look for pre-23 items um, and start applying the public domain statements to those, state, those items. Second, I'd look for material created more than 120 or 140 years ago. There's a good presumption that that material that created more than 120 or 140 years ago is in the public domain. Um, for unpublished items, unpublished material, like the kind we find in archives, it's not subject to the rigid 1923 rule that we're all accustomed to, but 120 to 140 years is probably a reasonable amount of time uh, to, to find items that are in the public domain. The third thing I would do is I'd look for material that's been licensed by your institution. If you already have licenses that allow you to make material available on your site, then that's, gen that's likely already in copyright. That material's in copyright. So you can clear off all of that in copyright stuff pretty quickly. The last thing I might do is I would look for works that were created by the federal government, by the US federal government, and I'd start applying uh, public domain US to those things. So that should get, through, get you through a good chunk of what you have, but it's not gonna get you through everything. And that's where the hard work, the really hard work begins. You've gotta spend some time digging into copyright issues and understanding how you calculate the copyright status of items. DPLA is gonna be there to help. DPLA is gonna provide advice and support um, to the extent that they can. Um, but there will be other opportunities to, to be able to calculate the copyright status of items or at least get help doing that. And the goal here is not to use the undetermined statement, but I will tell you a little secret. Uh, at NYPL, we expect to have about a third of our digital repository in the undetermined category, a third. That means that not all of the items on our sites are clearly in the public domain or clearly protected uh, by a license. It means that we're taking on risk, but that also means that I'm doing my job. I'm taking on that risk. Despite having hundreds of thousands of items up with an undetermined status for many, many years, we've never been sued for copyright infringement. Never. My phone, which is connected to our takedown email address, um, rarely goes into the full panic mode it is designed to go into when someone emails the takedown address. It happens. I'm glad it hasn't happened in the last hour, um, but it happens. <laughs> But when it happens, it means uh, we've been able to talk with the rights holders about the value of having their works on our site available to many users, contributing those works to DPLA, and making it very broadly accessible. Oftentimes, all the rights holders want from us is a copy. They just want to print, and that's all they want. And that's great. Those situations are really easy to deal with. Here's the print. Thank you for the license. We will make your material available online. Other times, often rights holders are just really reaching out to us to tell, tell us that they exist, that they're out there, and that they just want their credit on the, on the item. Usually they, they will ask for those copies, um, and we're always happy to give them. Almost always, uh, these conversations, when my phone goes off uh, and has the crazy, has the crazy meltdown, um, it always, so far, results in a license or a conversation um, and, and produces a result that supports NYPL's mission. So we haven't had a problem. So determining and applying rights, standardized rights statements on our digitized collections is a big project, uh, but it's a big project that's gonna help us achieve our mission of making shared cultural history more broadly available and more broadly accessible. We can do it. All right, thank you. So we have about five minutes for questions. Okay, I have two questions. Um, this is about uh, the Library of Congress's revision of Section 108. Yeah. Okay, so my first question is, when I looked at it, it looked to me like this year they're not allowing written comments. You have to make an appointment. Is that true? 
That is true. The, okay. According to the, the, the notice they put out, you have to call them or go in person. Okay, because that's what it looked like. And so then my next question is, is there someone out there, and I'm assuming like ALA or other, other groups you're involved with who are going to make an appointment, and our biggest concern, or for those of us in digitization, is uh, the DMCA change in 1998 when they said on the premises only. Mm -hmm. are, are we going to be able to get rid of that this time? And what, what is the advocacy that's going to be going on with these in-person meetings? Yeah. Thank you. So some of the institutions uh, like mine are going to submit comments. We're going to go talk to the office. Um, and, and ALA and ARL will also talk to the office. And the, the message is, is likely going to be, although it's only been a day, I haven't gotten the full message out there yet or uh, vetted yet. But so far, what we've been telling the office is that, that we can all sit down and write a really good Section 108 for us. We can write it without the word on-premises. We can get rid of the three-copy limit that's there today. It's really based on, on microfilm and not really doesn't make any sense for the digital the world. Um, there's an entire study group report about how 108 is not meeting our needs today. So we can all sit down and write this, one, this new 108. The concern, though, is that I can write it, but I don't think I can get it passed. Um, Libraries, as strong as we are, we are not nearly as strong as rights holders in, in DC. And I'm worried about reopening 108 in a way that encourages those uh, rights holders to step in and tinker with 108 in ways we don't like. So in the Hottie Trust lawsuit, there was an argument by the publishers that said that libraries have this special exception. They can do certain things allowed by 108. Um, and the argument they made was that that is the only exception that libraries can make. They don't get fair use, they don't get anything else. That was the argument. The judge, of course, got rid of that argument, said that was a bad argument, but if that's where rights holders wanna go, that makes me really nervous. So, so far, the message is gonna be um, 108 needs some reform, we think we can write a really good bill, but we're not confident that Congress can pass it. Uh, hello, I have a question, uh, a little bit more blue sky. Uh, on Thursday, I believe the committee is going to be voting on Carla Hayden's uh, nomination as Librarian of Congress. And I know that there's a lot of discussion about what should happen to the future of the Copyright Office. Do you have any thoughts or perspectives or whatever on that? Yeah, so I'll give you my personal perspective, not NYPL's perspective on it. I don't, NYPL doesn't have an official perspective on it. So my perspective is I would want the office, the Copyright Office, to remain in the Library of Congress. Their concerns about technology are valid. Um, if you've been to the Copyright Office's website, you know what it looks like. But I think it still belongs in the Library of Congress. And, and one of the concerns I have about moving it out is that mandatory deposit um, will we'll lose the ability for the Library of Congress to build collections. Now, in some of the proposals that are out there, there are ways for content that is uh, registered to be deposited, but I don't have a whole lot of confidence in those mechanisms. Unless they live in the same building, I'm not so confident about that. So that's my, my main concern. Um, there are other concerns. If you move it to other departments or other parts of the federal government, the, the focus of the office may change in ways that we don't like. Um, they're, they're in the library today, and they're still making decisions that uh, we might not all agree with. If they're out of the library, I'm really worried about regulatory capture and how those things will, will change. So uh, on, on uh, uh, Dominique Hayden's uh, confirmation, um, we hope that it goes through. We hope that it, they, they vote to approve. Um, and we hope that, that Hayden can bring, Dr. Hayden can bring some, some real uh, change to that, that library, and especially to the Copyright Office, to help them get into the 21st century and see the value of libraries in different ways. So now, like a lot of institutions, we have a very, cra very carefully crafted donation form. So when we receive a donation, we have a whole list of things as far as the rights transfer. But of course, uh, 30, 50, 75 years ago, you didn't do that. You know, they weren't, nobody was worried about rights, at least not to the extent that we are now. And so you'd have a handshake or maybe a reference in an annual report to a particular donation. So you have this kind of squishy arrangement with some some organization in the past, well now you're looking at the digitization potential of that collection. Your records say, yes, the donor gave this to the library. Mm -hmm. Is, 
there must be some legal application for that now. I mean, obviously you can't go back to the donor. They're dead or the organization's dissolved or whatever. But, I mean, how valid are those the old yeah. handshake agreements, as it were? Uh, so they're, they're probably valid. I mean, the, 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 there's two concerns there. One concern is about your physical ownership and your title to the physical items themselves. And that's likely not going to be questioned if you've got some record or some evidence that the library accessioned the material, it's in, a, it's in an annual report or something. Probably not going to be a problem. The, the harder question is what do you do about that material if there's no rights holder out there who you can go negotiate with and there's no provision to, that allows you to copy it or digitize it or whatever, uh, if, there, if that's not there, if you don't have that in an agreement, then you've got to start thinking about limitations and exceptions. So the, the collection that I mentioned that we digitized 20,000 items of, that was from the New York World's Fair from 1939 to 1940. When the World's Fair shut down, it shut down, it spun down in NYPL's main reading room. The office was actually in the reading room um, as they were closing down the corporation. So I have, uh, I don't know how many linear feet, but I have a lot of records for that, that organization. And I know that organization doesn't exist anymore because they, they wound down in, in our organization. So the rights in that are, are gonna be really tricky to find. And therefore that item is likely an orphaned item. Um, now today there is no special status in US law for orphan works. But there's a lot of good research and a lot of good evidence that orphan works are more amenable to fair uses than works where there's a clear rights holder. And that's in part because there's no market for those, those works. So my 20,000 photographs um, likely have no commercial value or very little commercial value. And therefore we thought that our use uh, as in educational material, in apps, in other display mechanisms were all fair uses. And we felt confident, uh, confident enough in that determination that I now talk about it publicly, putting a big old target on my back, um, somebody's gonna jump out. We told Congress about it, we told the Copyright Office about it, and still no one has come after me. So I feel pretty confident about that and about, orphan, about our use of those orphan works. So if I'm lacking an agreement like that, if I'm lacking the permission to digitize and make available, I'm gonna think a lot about our fair uses. We have time for one more question. Okay, oh wait, John has one. Bit of a question and, and maybe a, a poll to, if you don't mind, uh, just in terms of current utilization of uh, alternative statements, be they uh, represented by Creative Commons licenses, could, how many institutions are dipping their toe into uh, these Areas, show of hands, a few, that's a good start, okay. All right, good. And on that point, this is my question. So we have the 13, or to be 13 statements and the Creative Commons licenses. For those that are already actively using the license and the statements, the URIs and so forth, we're saying good, you, you, you are good. That's right. right. There's, there's no mapping to the nope. right statements. Nope. Those are acceptable and valid statements in DPLA's rights profile, rights statement. Okay. They'll be valid. And so they will also achieve the benefits of faceting and the, in the end user interfaces that will allow uh, some, some greater ease of use for end users. That's right. Transparency. That's right. All right, thank you. All right, thank you very much uh, to Greg.